Hello, and welcome back to Not Your Forte Podcast, a music education podcast geared towards college students as they try to survive and thrive throughout their undergrad and get ready to go out there and teach. I'm Eric Tinkler, a fourth year music education student at Kansas State University, and today I'll actually not be joined by my fantastic co-host, Dr. Bill Payne, because he's out of town. But don't worry, it's not just going to be an hour full of me talking with myself. We actually have a very special guest uh, upcoming on on the podcast today, Frank Troika, which he will introduce himself a little bit later. But before we get to that, let's tell you a little bit about the episode this week. We're going to be talking about everything you need to do in order to get that job when you're in that semester of student teaching and you're getting ready to finally graduate and get get a job. Um, There's there's a lot we're going to try to cover from from building your resume, what you need to have on there, how to format it, how to format a cover letter, to talking a little bit about interview techniques and also finding a job that fits for you and making sure that you are selective as well as their, your employers or your potential future employers so that you get yourself in the right situation that you need to be. As always, don't forget to share this with your friends, rate five stars, all those great things, and continue to be on the lookout on YouTube for um, my conducting blo- vlog as I go through my U-band conducting experience. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of things I'm learning, both on the good side and the bad side of thing. It's not all great, but it's it's through kind of those um, those little uh, weird times and, and mistakes that you learn the most. But anyways, enough of me talking. Let's go ahead. Let's introduce our guest. Hi there, Frank. How are you? Doing great, Eric. Great to talk to you this afternoon. Yeah, it's, uh, it's great to have you on. You want to go ahead and tell uh, the listeners a little bit about yourself, what you do and everything? Sure. Well, I've been a teacher in Texas my entire career. I taught for 31 years before I, quote, retired in December of 2014. And I put that word sort of in quotes because, ironically, I teach more now than I did when I was a public school educator because I'm not dealing with so many of the peripheral things, the faculty meetings, the attendance, and all the the other kinds of things that accompany the, the public school classroom. But for the last five years in particular, I've ramped things up quite a bit. I get to spend a lot of time working with young teachers and um, administrators, uh, kids, a lot of guest conducting. So I'm really, uh, really enjoying this phase of my career. Cool, exciting. Uh, before we get into kind of where you've been teaching and stuff like that, let's let's talk about where did you go to school? Well, I started school at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, and that was in the fall of 1978. And it was there that I met a band director. My band director there, his name was Eddie Green. He's very well known. And uh, it was by way of his experience that I learned about what was happening in Texas. And there were some phenomenal things going on. I couldn't believe that kids were playing the kind of literature that they were playing that I was hearing in these recordings. Uh, For instance, Lake Highlands Junior High playing Capriccio Espanol, um, Critico, uh, Flight of the Bumblebee, the, uh, the music for Prague. I mean, these are things that that are uh, approachable only by the best high school and college bands. And here, kids in 7th, 8th, and ninth grade were were performing these pieces. So uh, I decided I was going to take a big leap of faith. I transferred down to Texas, to the University of Texas at Arlington, which enabled me to stay very closely connected with Lake Highlands High School in the Richardson School District. So I finished my degree at UT Arlington and got my first job in Richardson, taught there for quite a while before I moved to Houston, where I taught uh, for about 15 years. Then I came back and finished my career in Richardson again, uh, where I completed my career at Berkner High School. And Richardson is the first suburb just north of Dallas. So I kind of bookended my career in the same school district. Cool, that's exciting. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about your your time teaching and stuff. You said you were down in Texas for a lot of it. Just what was that experience like, and what kind of students were you dealing with? Well... The kind of students we deal with over that the course of those 35 years now uh, has changed uh, quite a bit. But certainly, socioeconomically, things are changing just about everywhere. Um, very few places are becoming more affluent as time goes on with greater resources. So we're having to become more and more creative in how we uh, how we give those same experiences to our kids, as fewer and fewer of them are able to to uh, provide some of the, uh, the expenses that kind of go along with that, the instruments and the instruction. 
that often accompany um, this this profession. Um, so there's been quite a bit of change uh, in that regard. But I believe kids are kids everywhere you go, and you can find phenomenal band programs just about anywhere. And it's, and it's because of the leadership and the opportunities that teachers are willing to create for their kids. So in that regard, things haven't changed a whole lot. Teachers are teachers, kids are kids. And when you get the right combination of, uh, of information and energy and commitment, just about anything is possible. That, that's truly exciting and everything. Um, do you have any specific like memory or any highlights of your time while you're teaching that, that just always stick with you? Yeah, there, there are all kinds of moments like that. Um, early on, one of the most profound memories I, I have um, was when, as a young teacher, in fact, I was still an undergrad, I was spending a lot of time at uh, Lake Highlands High School. I had a lot of responsibility there with the marching band, and I had some ideas about how I wanted to make some things change, uh, to change the way we're doing some of our rehearsal procedures and some of the marching technique. But here I was working with one of the finest band programs in the United States, and who am I, this, you know, 20 something, to come in and make recommendations to them on how to evolve? So I went to the head director, his name was Malcolm Helm, phenomenal uh, teacher, one of the icons of the profession, very well known here in Texas. Um, he said, uh, he listened to me. I said, here's what I want to do. He said, okay, let's do it. Then, right, the next thing I said was, uh, what if it doesn't work? And he said, well, then we'll just try something else. And I, and I think that's absolutely a huge thing to that all, all college age students really need to know is wherever you're going, uh, whether you're student teaching or helping out, be, be open to discussing things with the directors in, in, a, in a nice, respectful manner, uh, because there's tons of great ideas that as life goes on, oh, everything, yeah. new ideas keep popping up. And that's, that's amazing. Yeah, it is. And, and the thing that's so cool that I learned from that moment was Malcolm was encouraging my creativity rather than playing it safe and saying, no, this is how we do it and this works. And he was basically telling me that, that it wasn't going to be my head on a platter if it didn't work. We'll just try something else. So he was encouraging my creativity. And I made note of that so that when I became a head director myself in charge of my own program, that whoever I'm working with, I don't want to, I don't want them to be afraid to think outside of what we've been doing, to think differently. And, uh, you know, nothing kills creativity faster than a to-do list and a, and, uh, you know, a task list. So I try to stay away from those early in the creative process. So that was a huge, profound moment. Another one was uh, about seven years into my career, I, I had a moment where I felt pretty, um, oh, pretty inadequate. That is because I had not done enough to teach my kids about, about tuning. And I don't mean just tuning their instruments. I mean ensemble tuning. Mm -hmm. Equal temperament versus just intonation. And so it was uh, at, at that time when I was told I needed to do, to do a better job of that, that I said I was going to become an expert in that area, and I made it my mission to learn as much as I could about it. I just wish I could go back and have those, those seven years back with those kids that I did not have that information for and give them another shot at it. Which, if the listeners want to know anything and a little bit more about tuning, I recommend the book um, Tuning for Wind Instruments by Shelly uh, Jago, I believe. I recently, That's it. That's the book. recently purchased it, and it it's it's a little little heady at times and stuff, goes into the science of everything, but it's, it's a lot of great information. <laughs> yeah, there's phenomenal information in that book. I use it myself, and uh, uh, you know, you just, you have to, you have to do your research and you have to ask questions, and the thing that for any young teachers, the, the thing I try to strive for, uh, to get them to do is not to be afraid to reveal your ignorance to, the, to your mentors. Your mentors are there to fill in the gaps for you. And I had these wonderful teachers around me, but I was, I was too preoccupied with not letting them know what I didn't know. So I was reluctant to ask questions sometimes um, for fear they might think less of me. And that was just, just silly. Mm -hmm. so, it, it, it goes yeah. back to, to what you said just a little bit earlier. You. You can't be afraid of, of making mistakes. It's something all of us musician, musicians hear every day in ensembles. Is don't yes. be afraid to take a risk. If it doesn't work, doesn't work. You'll just do something else. And just yep. something that ingrained in us when whenever we're playing and stuff, and we just need to continue to take that into teaching. Um, sure. It, yeah, there's more than one path to the top. Sure. So when something's not working, 
you try something else and you see what does work. And I just think that makes it exciting to, to teach and to learn. So we, we've talked a lot about kind of like your, your, your time in teaching high school and everything. What do you, what do, you do now? Because I, I know it's a full list of things you're up to. Well, I never aspired to teach at the collegiate level. Uh, it is, and, and no disrespect to the college world, it's just not something I ever aspired to. And I found such fulfillment in teaching middle schoolers and high schoolers. But ironically, now I'm on the faculty of three universities that, uh, in an adjunct capacity. I'm at Sam Houston State University, uh, where I exclusively supervise student teachers and do some guest lecturing. For the last three years, I've been on the faculty at Southern Methodist University, where I actually have graduate and undergraduate classes that I teach there. Uh, on a rotating basis. And then uh, just this year, I joined the faculty of Oklahoma State University as an adjunct instructor in music education. Uh, again, I don't have any classes uh, that I'm responsible for directly, but I go in and I contribute to the classes, to the curricula that are already in place. And I just found this to be so much fun and so fulfilling because I get to help college students and young teachers avoid some of the mistakes and the failure paths that I took and to fill in the gaps for them that uh, I know exist uh, in your, you know, none of us learn how to be a teacher in college. And uh, we have to, we have to look for other experiences to, to fill in those gaps. And, and you do a lot of stuff with, uh, with Con Seller. That's actually how I met you. You want to talk a little bit about your role there? Yes, I do. Uh, the Con Seller Division of Education has been a game changer for me. When I was a teacher, before I became formally involved with them as a, a senior educational uh, clinician, and they've invested tremendous financial resources into supporting teachers. I, I literally fly all over the world on behalf of Consumer to uh, deliver instruction to kids, to adults, uh, and even at, at times to, uh, to government officials uh, in support of music education. So... Uh, uh, in the Con Summer Institute, which happens this summer, June 7th through the through the 10th, Sunday through Thursday, it's just a phenomenal, intimate gathering of music educators of all ages and experience. And of course, you and I met by way of the collegiate track, mm -hmm. uh, which is just a phenomenal resource to to teachers, uh, young teachers, aspiring teachers, as young as just leaving high school until the time they are ready to enter the profession uh, to start the job hunt and. Uh, uh, and just build build a network of people who can mentor and be a resource. And it really, it, I mean, having gone last year, it really does that that part of filling in those gaps that you don't always get within your classroom. Yeah. It, it's taking that above and beyond uh, what the normal college student does. Exactly, exactly. And I also, uh, I'm the director of education for System Blue, which is the educational arm of the Blue Devils from the Beagle Corps. So I stay very closely tied to that uh, part of the of the music world music education world, and uh, I get to coordinate high events for high school students in conjunction with the Blue Devils members and staff. Those happen primarily during the summer, although we've started expanding to the concert area and to professional development workshops, that type of thing, year-round. That's that's really exciting, and talking a little bit more recently, uh, TMEA just got done. How is that? I'll tell you what, TMEA is just, it's always so exciting. The number of clinics and performances is just overwhelming. And you listen to the Allstate groups and you, and you hear what these kids are capable of doing in such short order. It's just inspiring to know that, that uh, music education is so vibrant in, in the United States. And the rest of the world looks to us to model their systems after and to learn best practices. So, uh, yeah, TMEA is just about as exciting as it gets. That's super awesome. So let, let, let's go ahead. Let's get a little bit into what we're actually going to talk about. We're, we're kind of figuring out as we were getting near the end of the semester, I have a lot of friends and a lot of people who I know who are student teaching right now, and they're looking uh -huh. for jobs. They're sending out applications. Um, some are getting interviews and stuff like that. But let, let's go a little bit more in depth on kind of what, what that's going to consist of and how, how we can get that job when we're looking for it and also get a job that's going to be good for us. So the, the first thing is resumes. The, this is something that there's no class for it in college, and it's something that to a lot of people is like, I have no idea what I'm doing. So yeah. like, where, do, where, where do we start when we're, we're building a resume? Well, you know, your resume is, is supposed to give a real snapshot of 
who you are and your qualifications. Uh, I see sometimes people sort of write a narrative form in their resumes to describe briefly what, what it is they're doing. That's not necessary in a resume. That's what a cover letter is for. That's what an interview is for. The resume is basically categorized information about you that shows who you are, your qualifications, what you've done, and allows the prospective employee to uh, start to match your skills with the skills of the job. So the way I suggest we, that a, a resume is formatted is, first of all, a nice strong header at the top with the name and contact information. I do not recommend that you include a photo as part of the resume. Uh, one reason is because they don't often print well, but the real reason is is because sometimes people make snap judgments about what they see, and that's uh, that's unfortunate. But we, you know, we're human beings, and mm-hmm. and sometimes that's what we do. In fact, I, I remember one person uh, passing over a candidate because they thought he was too good looking, and it's like it would be a distraction. Now, I mean, that just gets ridiculous, but. You know, that's kind of the, that's the kind of thing that, that I'm, I'm sure I'm sure the becomes, too good looking thing would it would be my case if I put my picture on there. But well, I was going <laughs> to advise you about that, Eric. You know, got to be really careful and don't do the big reveal until the interview itself. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you know, so you get your you get the header at the top with your contact information. The very next thing is your education and if you're certified or what your certification status is. Uh, so, in other words, if your certification is, is uh, not completed yet, then you say anticipated May of 2020 or certification pending. If your GPA is favorable, I suggest listing the GPA. Uh, if your GPA is higher in your music classes than it is overall, I would list a separate GPA in music. Uh, but, all, again, only if it's favorable. Then uh, I recommend we get it. There's a category for professional experience, and then you might... Uh, that could be student teaching, that could be teching, could be observations, anything that connects you directly with the professional world. Um, and then, uh, and of course, you list these in reverse chronological order. You want the, the most recent experiences first. Then maybe any awards or special recognitions uh, the student may have received, followed by a related experience. For instance, if you, if you performed in a select chamber group, if you performed at... Uh, Maybe, say you're a saxophonist, you performed at NASA, or uh, uh, maybe you are a trumpet player, you performed at the National Trumpet Competition. Maybe you marched drum corps, or something like that. Uh, and then if you'd like to, any professional associations you're part of, maybe NAFME or your state association, things like that. So, going on, we, we, we talked a lot about kind of like things that you're putting on there and a little bit about kind of how you like to see a format. Why, why is it important to format a resume well instead of just throwing it well, all on there? It's got to be easy to find information, and when you categorize it, it's easy for your eye to go straight to professional experience or straight to related experience or straight to certification rather than looking at a long document where you have to go searching for things. So I like to create white space, both in a resume and in a cover letter. It's a little bit easier on the eyes. Bullets draw your attention to itemized things rather than having to search for the beginning of a new topic. Uh, And I like to see nice, clean lines justified to the left with clean indentations and then on the right all the dates justified to the right and this is where you've got to not rely on the space bar to create this this cleanliness you have to learn how to use the the left right and center tabs correctly when you're formatting in a word processor so that it looks clean and very professional because oftentimes the resume is the first impression that's created and if it looks sloppy that says something about the individual and they may not even be considered just because the resume looks less than the kind of person they would like to, to have working with them. And it, it's, we go back to just kind of what people do, and we, we, we make snap judgments very, very easily. It's just yeah. part of the human nature. If you, if you see two resumes uh, and you're looking to, looking to hire, you see one that looks just absolutely phenomenal, super neat, really easy to read, and you see one that's a little bit jumbled, you're, you're naturally going to be looking at the one that's a lot nicer looking to start out with. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And the, you know, the, 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 if you go online and you start looking for resume uh, templates, most of the time they're created by the business world. And the business world and the education world are a little bit different in some regards. Uh, you'll see sometimes on a business resume, it will say at the bottom, references available on, upon request. I don't have any idea what that's about. 
my recommendation is you have a separate page for your list of references, and you format the header on that that separate page the same way you format your resume, so it's very easy to print to match whose references go with which resume, and uh, and you list people there that can speak from direct observation to uh, your ability to teach and your success at the collegiate level. Mm -hmm. And we, we've been taught, as I know this is an audio medium right here, but we're going to share some examples and stuff on our, on our Facebook page to just make sure that you take a look there. Once this comes out, we'll share res, or resumes that are both great examples and also some bad examples too, so that you can get a little bit of a visual aspect with this too, instead of us just describing it. <laughs> sure, sure. So yeah, kind of going a little bit more, um, we talked about a little bit about kind of what we're wanting to put on it to make us a, a more hireable, more attractable uh, candidate. Can we go a little bit more in depth in that for say, sure. talking about work experience? Like as someone like, I know a lot of people my age have had many different jobs. I have had probably five or six different jobs in the past two years. Just because being a, in college, you have to find what, what works best with your schedule and your schedule's constantly changing. What do you leave yeah. on there? What do you take off? Well, I wouldn't list six jobs in two years. Uh, and I know as a college student, that's, that's kind of the name of the game because as your schedule changes, you may have to match that up with, with um, whatever's available. But I would list the things where you felt that, that are the most relevant and the and ones that contribute most to your career as a teacher. So did you do something that involved working with people? Being a waiter or a, a host in a restaurant is a great one because you're constantly dealing with people and oftentimes you're dealing with people who have complaints. And you're, so you're learning how to deal with, with individuals and how to serve them. That's important. Um, if you have uh, anything where you are the supervisor or you have an opportunity to advance within that job to be given more responsibility, that would be an indicator of your upward mobility and your desirability, the fact that uh, you've proven yourself to be someone worthy of promotion. And, and, and going sir, on, I would sir, say... If you've been a private lesson teacher, that's a great one. Private teaching, uh, helping with sectionals at a, a school, being a marching tech, uh, anything like that is going gonna, is gonna to contribute to your, your, your attractiveness. And I'm not, I'm not sure about your, your opinion on this, but I think potentially having at least one thing that shows a little bit of diversity. I, I, this last summer, I, I've spent, spent working as a research assistant in agronomy. Uh, I was doing a variety of helping with lab tests, helping uh, field research, and, and just things that are not involved with music or teaching or anything whatsoever. Um, but what are your thoughts on, on putting like something on there that shows a little bit of well-roundedness or diversity? Well, if I saw your resume, with that experience, I would instantly gravitate toward that because I tell kids all the time, every day, band is a big group science project. We're always testing hypotheses. We're always looking for commonalities and exceptions. We're looking for cause and effect relationships. We're trying to isolate things to see if they're the cause of certain problems. So I'm all about that. And of course, I believe that, uh, that music is a combination of so many sciences anyway, and the kinds of thought processes they develop. So yeah. I am all about that. In fact, it wasn't until the second semester of my senior year that I decided to forego a, a, a scholarship in college uh, based on science to pursue music. I just got that turned on to music, and uh, so so I'm I, I'm with you on that. Which, side note on that, I had many people question the fact that I would I, I would I would be at work and someone would be like, "So what's what's your major? What are you doing uh, in agronomy?" I'd be like, "Well, I'm in music." they're like why are you here so that was always that was always a fun story i knew i knew a guy who worked there and and, and was able to uh, connect with with the the boss and get the job there and probably some of the most fun fun stuff i did over the summer well see i think that's a podcast in itself how you connect agronomy with music to non-musicians oh I and mean, especially if you're working in, in a rural area i know a lot of people in kansas there's especially western kansas a lot of a lot more farmers out there. Um, but well, anyways. You may not know this, but I was born in, in Mississippi. And uh, I graduated from high school in, in Sturgis, Michigan, a small town of about 8,000 people. So I kind of get the – my math teacher was also also a farmer. So uh, 
I, I kind of get where you're coming from. <laughs> So going on a little bit, you mentioned uh, kind of a little bit of a difference between a resume and a cover letter. I know yeah. a cover letter to me is, is, is still something that's kind of a really different concept and one that's talked even less than resumes. Can we, can we go in depth yeah. about what's a cover letter? What do you need on it? Yeah, let's do that. Um, now, if I could back up just for a second, there's a resume and then there's a CV or curriculum vitae. And a curriculum vitae is basically a chronological history of everything you've done. It can still be categorized, but it lists, it's a comprehensive uh, document that shows every, basically everything you've done in that particular professional field. A resume, by definition, is a summary of that, which is why you want to keep it brief. The business world tells you one page only. I don't know that that needs to be a hard and fast rule. Uh, I've, I've seen resumes that were front and back, and I don't really have a problem with that. But now a cover letter might be better called a letter of introduction because that's really what it is. And the letter of introduction is uh, is a, a narrative that uh, allows you to communicate a little bit more about your background, your uh, accomplishments, your direction, and it allows you connect, to connect with a specific job. A cover letter should be matched to the job you are going for and not be a, a generic thing. Like I would never address a cover letter to whom this may concern. It's always... Dear Dr. So-and-so or Dear Ms. So-and-so, whoever the person is that is in charge of making this next-level decision. So uh, the cover letter is important because you, you've got to, it, it, the way it looks also that I think is, is pretty critical. And if you don't mind, I'm ready to launch right into that if that's okay. Yeah, let's go ahead. Let's talk cover letters. All right. In terms of the formatting, I think it's a good idea to uh, send a cover letter as a PDF not as um, a Word document or a native, a native text document, because you never know how the formatting is going to translate uh, depending on what software is used to, uh, to import it. So I, I recommend PDFs because that way you're, you're pretty much guaranteed that uh, what it's going to look like. Uh, it's okay to write a cover letter in the body of an email, but I think it would be a good idea also to attach it, attach a PDF, just so they can easily print it and distribute it to other people for the interview or to other colleagues that may be relevant in this whole process. So when I'm, uh, when I'm looking at a, at a well-designed cover letter, what I look for is white, white space. Most people are not going to read a lot of text. And so when you see a cover letter that uh, goes on and on, people tend not to read. It's the same, way we, so approach, the, way I, it's the same way we I, approach our history textbooks. See a lot of, of course, words and you absolutely. don't read it. <laughs> well, and that's why you see more and more textbooks that, have, that, have, that break up all that text with illustrations and with headers and different colors. Only if, so, the, only if uh, the grout could follow instance, suit. <laughs> I'm sorry, say that again? Only if the grout could follow suit, the music history book. Oh, it's... well, yeah, the grout is grout, you know. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's the industry standard, so we always have to admit that's one of the, uh, the, the sort of the, the, the prices that we pay, the, the rites of passage for us as music majors. But I recently got a cover letter, um, and it was very well written, but this cover letter was indented in all single space. Every paragraph was indented, which is great. But what I recommend it is let's get all those indentations out of there and put an extra space uh, between each paragraph. And the ideal cover letter, I think, starts off with a formal salutation, Dear Dr. So-and-so, and has the date at the top as well. Uh, then you state... Uh, what position you're looking for, and what uh, and who you are. For instance, please consider this letter of interest for the position of assistant band director at Hometown Junior High School. I have a degree in music education and horn performance from this university, and I believe that my experiences thus far have prepared me for to serve or to serve the programs in the Hometown School District. So you've got a brief introductory paragraph. This here's who I am. Here's where my degree's from, and uh, here's the position I'm interested in. The next paragraph, you go into your specific qualifications. At my university, I studied this with this person. I performed in the wind ensemble, the horn octet. I performed in the symphony orchestra. I student taught at this school. I was under the mentorship of these people. I marched with the, with the pride of the university marching band, whatever that is. Uh, then. I rehearsed and conducted at several concerts during my student teaching. I organized and taught sectionals, these kinds of things. So you're giving now your professional qualifications. And that's the largest paragraph in your letter. The first one is small, 
The second one's larger. And as you go further and further down, any subsequent paragraphs, in my opinion, you should work to make smaller as you go. People will continue to read as long as it doesn't become more cumbersome. And if you're if you're applying for a, a job that's, that's very attractive, there are going to be lots of cover letters, and you want people to get to the bottom of yours. So I recommend that we not discuss philosophy, we not go off into abstract things in the cover letter, because that's what you can get in, get to the interview. That's what the interview is for. The cover letter is to match your qualifications and, and skill set with the job itself and to distinguish you among other people in the, the, the pool. So third paragraph, additional qualifications. You might say this might be where you talk about uh, marching drum corps or having gone to the national trumpet competition or something like that. Then maybe a short paragraph that says, uh, I believe that uh, that the sum total of my performance educational experiences, my work ethic, my commitment have prepared me for this particular position. Thank you for your time. I look forward to your reply. Uh, I tell people don't ever say, please call me at your earliest opportunity so we can discuss this further. That is not your position to tell someone to call you. You're asking for their consideration, so you invite them, but you don't give them a directive, put it that way. And then maybe the most important thing here, or one of the most important things, is as soon as you do your closing, sincerely, comma, Eric Tinkler, you put your cell phone number right there underneath your name so that this person can make an impulse call. They've read your cover letter, they're impressed with you, boom, make a call. And then, I don't know about you, Eric, but I'm in the habit of ignoring phone numbers I don't recognize on my cell phone. When you're on, when you're on the job hunt, you answer every call regardless because you just never know it could be opportunity calling. So we, we, we're focusing a lot on people who are currently looking for jobs and everything. What about, let, let's talk a little bit about the, the younger students, uh, people who are freshmen, sophomores, juniors even. What can they do right now to do things that where they can add add to the resume, add to what their attractiveness is as a candidate? Well, the people they can work at the most at that stage of their careers are the professors they're seeing every day. Show up on time and regularly to class because that's the job itself. When you you know for for your entire life you've been a student, right, Eric? That's, that's the only job you've ever had, really. Mm -hmm. That's that been your main thing. And suddenly you go into the classroom as a student teacher and that switch flips and now you're supposed to be on the other side of that equation and most people aren't prepared for that level of responsibility. So uh, you, 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 practice the, you practice the job while your job is being a student. So study your instrument with the same intensity and commitment and vigor as a performance major would because when you put down your instrument you pick up a baton your new instrument is your ensemble, or that, that class of beginning band kids. That's your new instrument, and you have to learn how to practice them. You have to learn how to, how to instruct strategically and work out problems and, and be a, a very strategic thinker uh, when, you're, when you're doing it, just like you would on your instrument. So build relationships, go out and observe. Uh, go, go, to, go to programs, especially if there are programs uh, that you want to eventually get, have a job in send a letter uh, to those to those teachers and just say, would it be possible for me to come by and just observe a rehearsal at some point? And uh, then you start to get your name out and people start to recognize you and, and you start to build again, build relationships. And that's really the key to all of this. So uh, it's, it's being a private I... teacher is a great way to, to get some experience and build a resume while you're still an undergrad. It's really how, how you get to uh, go out there, uh, meet people. It's how you get to interview the Frank Troikas of the world and everything. Uh, I, <laughs> I, we, we've talked on this podcast before about the importance of getting yourself out there, of being actively involved in, in both your classes, in whatever organizations that you might be interested. But also, we haven't talked a lot about the idea of networking. I, we, Frank talked a little bit about his time at TMEA, and for whatever state you're in, Go to your state convention while you're in college. Absolutely. That is Absolutely. such a wonderful opportunity to connect with people in your age and also people in the profession that you're going into. Um, there's yeah. a lot of times, I know at KMEA, there's always a Kansas State like little luncheon or whatever for all K-State grads, and that's just ripe ground for talking to people who, who had a similar experience to you and are now out there doing what, what you're wanting to do. And you couldn't be, you couldn't be more right. Eric, it's just exactly what it is. I just had uh, one of our alumni from the 
Comstone Institute uh, emailed me not too long ago and said, hey, I'm going to my state convention. How do I network? What do I do? And I, I, some suggestions I get or just at the end of a, of, a, of a clinic, just walk up, introduce yourself to the presenter, thank them for what you, what you learned, maybe exchange topics. Maybe you send a follow-up email a few days later just saying, I, I got to meet you at the convention. I was reminding them how much you appreciated what they had to say and how much you learned. And, of course, uh, hanging out, like you said, after in the hallways, after after presentations are over. And, of course, if you're of age, hanging out where the social beverages are flowing and that kind of thing. That's a little <laughs> bit further down the line for most people. So I don't well, recommend that. This is more that, senior so. year stuff yeah. when, when we, yeah. we only endorse legal drinking. <laughs> exactly. Um, you got it. it it's, um, the Boston Brass came, came to K-State uh, about a month ago. And Chris Castellanos, the the horn player with the Boston Brass, he always says the biggest thing is just introduce yourself. That's the first right. step to getting to yeah. know someone and for someone to know your name. Well, and when you introduce yourself, you look them in the eye and you smile and you give a nice firm handshake. And everything, with all those things uh, are memorable things because they, they, they show confidence in yourself and, and a sincere desire to connect with someone. So, yeah, I'm, I'm in. Once again, we're going to transition a little bit. We're talking about resumes and stuff. What about your resume gets picked? You get you get that job interview. What what do you do? What what's the first step? Um, what do you wear? What do you even wear? Well, you dress professionally, and if you are uh, and conservatively, that's what I recommend because public school education is a conservative institution, and an administrator does not want to deal with controversy. Now. This, this whole uh, persona, teacher persona has evolved over the years. And, we, you know, there are certain things like piercings, gauges, tattoos, all of them become very commonplace. But what I recommend to prospective uh, employees, prospective teachers, is to be very conservative in their dress and, uh, and not to appear in any way controversial. Um, and if anyone, if everyone's right present themselves however they want. And I, I would never tell anyone that they need to conceal who they are. I don't, I don't, that's not, my, that's not what I'm suggesting. What I'm suggesting is that you make yourself as attractive to as broad a cross-section of people as possible because that's who we have to teach. We have to teach every child and, and we have to appeal to every child's parents as well. So be as approachable as, as you possibly can. So dress conservatively and neatly, show up early. Nothing is more off-putting than setting up an appointment with someone and having them be late. So you uh, you check, you, you make phone calls to find out where to park, uh, what the procedures are for entering the building. Uh, you bring m- materials with you that uh, are going to support your your uh, qualifications. For instance, I always recommend that, that students bring uh, their method binders with them. Whatever notes they took, their methods, their, their, their classes they took in instrumental methods classes, because they may be asked a question about pedagogy, or uh, they may be asked, Who's your, who are your mentors? Tell me who your mentors are. Uh, when you're when you're faced with a situation where you don't have an answer to a question, what do you do? And if you can pick out a binder or a list of people that are your mentors, that kind of thing, it shows that you are anticipating the possibilities and not simply uh, being reactive, but you're being proactive. Uh, and then invariably, you're going to be asked to tell us about yourself. And that's where you look to make connections. You look to explain why you wanted to, what brought you to music in the first place, and what you hope to do as a teacher. Uh, and, uh, of course, have copies of your resume with you, uh, and uh, enough copies that, uh, that you can distribute them should there be you know, uh, more people than you anticipated. And and this this comes into something you can do before the interview, and it's just doing your due diligence and researching everything you can about both the district, about the job you're looking to to interview for, about the area yeah. as a whole, just so you you know you're not going to be surprised by anything. Right. And you're always gonna, there's always going to be some questions you can't anticipate, but the more prepared you go in, the more you're able to speak from uh, from your own personal knowledge. Then the more you create a common ground for you and your respective employers. So yeah, to go to the websites, find out what the mission of the school is, uh, find out um, how many 
performing organizations they have, what is their mascot, those kinds of things. It may seem very incidental, but again, you're looking for anything that shows that you've already connected yourself to that organization. I, I think one of the biggest things, regardless of, of what it is, is people can tell whether you, you genuinely care or if you genuinely don't care. It, it, it's, it's something that it, it's, it's very easy to see. And so showing that if, if this is the job that you want, showing that you care about getting this job. Sure, sure. And I don't want to seem like you're pleading for something. You just want to express your enthusiasm for the profession as a whole, for teaching as a whole. You just happen to teach music. And that's something that an upper administrator for sure wants to hear, that it, it, it's about teaching the kid. You're just using music as your vehicle for teaching those those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. You know, and it, it, another thing you do to prepare is to do mock auditions. I'm actually not mock auditions, but mock interviews. And I suggest you take things to the next level where you video yourself being interviewed because they'll discover mannerisms that you weren't aware of. You may discover that you're not looking people in the eye or that you're looking away. Uh, you might find that you have distractors in your speech, um, like, okay, so, you know, those things that interrupt the flow of what you're trying to say, and that can then uh, allow you to work on that particular skill as well. It. This honestly just keeps drawing back to to the concepts as musicians that that we continue to learn. I mean, you 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 mistakenly said mock auditions, but it's it's a similar process. You when you're practicing, you need to you need to record yourself because there's things that whether it's an interview, an audition, or whatever, there's things you do that you just don't notice because it, it's habit. I know in the time I've been recording this podcast, I have noticed a lot of things that I do that I'm like, oh, that's kind of interesting that I, I say that word this way or, or I speak in this certain way. Specifically, I, I learned I, instead of saying the word on, I say arn, which is <laughs> unique. I blame my grandma. Where are you from again? Is uh, that a Kansas thing? I, no, no of my, none of my friends say it. I blame my, my grandmother for it. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't well, I was in Mississippi, so... I was under the impression that every word, no matter how small, had at least two syllables, so I get it. <laughs> but anyways, uh, just like what Frank was saying, and I know Dr. Payne, K-State does a really great job of this. When you're uh, last semester before you student teach, they do have uh, you record when you're doing your mock interview and stuff uh, for, for mm-hmm. your finals um, projects as you're getting through, um, just getting closer to student teach. And it, it's something that... You can start. You can start now. You can start at any time. Just yeah. record yourself talking or giving presentations or whatever you're in, and start picking up on yeah. kind of the the cues in which you've learned over your 18 plus years of life, and be like, okay, that's kind of a weird thing that I might need to like pull back a little bit. So, Eric, let me ask you a question. When when will you do your student teaching? I'll be student teaching in the spring of 21. All right. So you've got another year. Something I'm going to encourage you to do when you do your student teaching is video yourself, video yourself uh, for the, the entire rehearsal, and do it from the perspective of the student. So as if you were a student in the ensemble looking at you, then go back, get up your instrument, and sit in your own rehearsal and participate in your own rehearsal. You'll learn so much about pacing and about timing, and you'll discover that you want to play your instrument more than you want to listen to somebody talk about it. And, and that's and, just a huge catalyst to being an effective teacher is to, is to put yourself in the position that you want to And we know that so much as musicians at this point. We've been playing our instruments since sixth, fifth grade. You know in a rehearsal when you're just sitting there and the director just keeps trying to talk and stuff like that. And you just, I just want to play. And exactly. The students are going to be thinking the same thing. I, I've been conducting a university band it's a student-led ensemble uh, where the conductors apply and get selected to be a part of it and that that's one thing that that i i noticed right right now that i'm trying to work on is, is less talking more playing yeah and it's especially if you're in a, in a program that's fortunate enough to have more than one ensemble if you'll treat that third band as if the only time they'll ever have their instruments on their faces when they're in front of you then you're going to teach a lot more urgently because you're not going to rely on them to too much outside of your presence. Now, that's not something you're just going to accept. You want to look for ways to motivate kids to do some things independently. I mean, that's the goal of all teaching anyway, is to create independence for our students. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, that urgent participation in class is the stepping stone to inspire them to want to spend more time independently. Because we can create more success for them if they are 
that their participation is high. So let's get back to uh, talking a little bit more about the interviews. What are some common questions that, that, that occur that we can start thinking about and, and be prepared yeah. for? Well, one of the first is, uh, I'm getting back to yourself, and that's where you want to be, have that, that answer already rehearsed. You'll, you may be asked something like, uh, like this, does poverty affect learning? Because all of us, virtually all of us, are going to deal with kids that struggle uh, at home with uh, their family struggle financially. And that's, a, that's an important question. And I'll, I remember recently a former student of mine was asked that question in an interview, and his interview, his response was, I teach every kid, so no, poverty does not affect learning. But that's from his perspective. But from a, the perspective of a kid, if a kid's hungry, if a kid goes home to an unstable environment, they're not motivated to do homework or practice. They're in survival mode. And when you're hungry, you're not thinking about school. So poverty does affect learning. You've got to be able to cite why it affects learning. Mm-hmm. You'll maybe ask if you're, how do you deal with someone, who, uh, an unhappy parent? What, what is your concept? How do you teach tonal concepts? What, what, uh, what is your way of in, intonation in your ensemble? Uh, so maybe, I've even seen uh, directors that would, that would ask, give me two ways to finger F on the oboe. Or which keys, which notes do you flick uh, on the bassoon? Things like that. And when you get to those kinds of questions, if you don't have the answer, just say, I don't know that. I don't recall that. We have my this class. And that's when you whip out your book and you show them where you can find that answer. Or you list your mentors on every instrument that you have direct access to. They can help you with that information. That's really good. But, uh, you know, I'd be, I'd be happy to, to submit a, a list of potential interview questions as well if you'd like to post those on your Facebook site as well. I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, that, that would be absolutely phenomenal. And I'm, sh- I'm sure the listeners would really appreciate that as well as I. Well, and all of these questions I'll give you are ones that actually come from people that are doing the interviews. These are not questions I just thought of. Uh, some of them are questions I had when I was interviewing people, but I've also compiled a list from many of the most respected uh, music supervisors and teachers uh, I know. So we, we've talked a little bit um, about kind of what's in the interview and stuff. What, what's a warning sign, do you think, when you when you walk into a room for an interview that perhaps this, this might not be a district for you? Because I, I, I do think that you do need to be selective in where you're wanting to go still, just because you don't want to put yourself in a situation to where it's, it's just going to be miserable. Well, as a young teacher getting your first job, it's a rare thing that the first job you have is the job you're going to have for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. It does happen from time to time. I've known people who've done that. But that was not my, my situation, and it isn't for most people. So I think you go into every job. I mean, I'll ask, I'll ask student teachers all the time, what's the, what's the objective of the interview? And invariably, their answer is to get the job, and that's not right. The, the objective of the interview is to get the job offer. Because once you've got the job offer, now you've got you're in a position where you can ask some questions you might not otherwise. But if, as far as warning signs... Uh, if they seem to be in too big a hurry to hire someone. That can be a bit of a warning sign. They're looking just to fill a position rather than to build a team or to, uh, to do something that is, that is thoughtfully, uh, thoughtfully approached. I think that, that's a warning sign. Uh, if you are offered the job, then some questions you might ask afterwards would be, does it, what other responsibilities might I have that are not specifically teaching music? And that's when you may find out that you're going to be asked to get a Class C license and drive a bus to football games. Or you might have to supervise two or three periods of in-school suspension. And if those are deal breakers, then you want to know that before you accept the job. So that those kind of questions fall in the category of what happens after the interview, uh, after, excuse me, after the, after the offer, not before the offer. Awesome. Let's... And if I could go off, and just, this, is a, this is not really something I'd consider to be a warning sign, but, uh, you know, we, we as teachers, most of us don't go into this profession uh, because we are looking to get rich doing it. Now, that being said, teachers can make a very good living and can provide a, for a very sound retirement. All those things are possible. They be starting teacher thing uh, is more of a myth than the reality, I believe. But that being said, uh, most websites, most school districts will have a salary schedule posted somewhere where you can find out 
what the base salary is. And the thing you might not be able to find out is what sort of stipend is available uh, for the additional time that music teachers often often uh, spend. But if I call in human resources, usually you can get those answers over the phone. So we've kind of we've talked about building resumes. We talked about interviews. One quick thing I, I want to discuss uh, be- before we kind of wrap up here. How do you find the available jobs? Well, that's where the networking thing is, is really important because if you are networking, then you've got people out there that, that you can say, hey, have you heard any, any movement happening in this part of the state, any movement happening in this school district? I know that uh, in Texas, the, at the TMEA website, uh, there's a job database there where jobs are posted all the time. And it's easy to go there and see what's available. And that, you don't have to be a member of TMEA to do that. It's available to the public. Many school districts have their own, will have jobs posted on their websites as well. Uh, so I think this is where you, uh, you, have to, you have to network with people also. Uh, make, you know, so you, you, know, you know what's out there before, maybe even before it becomes public. Frank, any, any final thoughts or anything on or, or just this topic of resumes, interviews that you really want to just try to hit home? Well, yeah, be honest. You don't want to represent yourself in a way that you can't deliver on. Uh, you know, you, your resume and your cover letter certainly want to convey the very best of what you have to offer, but not more than you have to offer. I think that's that's probably a, a pretty big one. Uh, and you, like I said earlier, you, you do your homework, learn about the, the, the jobs that you're, you're going after, and build relationships. Very well put. Frank, I have just one last question for you. Um, let's sure. let's think about freshman year of college. What what's advice that that you would give yourself um, as a as a freshman in college? You right now giving yourself advice. What advice would you give yourself? You know, I, that's a, this is going to sound like an arrogant answer because so much of what I would tell myself to do, if I can go back again, sort of was done by default because of my circumstances. I. My car was always breaking down, so I was forced to sit around and observe a place where I longer than I meant to. So I was stuck there, sort of observing private lessons and observing rehearsals I wouldn't have observed otherwise. I was surrounded by people who were just great teachers, and so I got to I got to learn constantly. So my advice to freshmen would be to to go beyond what's asked of you, go beyond what you're given. And it's just, just don't settle for for good enough because that rarely is. And it makes, it makes the job, it makes your, your college career more exciting too to know that you're doing, you're not just surviving it, but you're actually, you're actually going above and beyond. Really, really well put, Frank. Frank, um, is there anywhere where uh, listeners can hear you talk or how can we contact you uh, if, if we want to learn a little bit more? best way to contact me, I think, would be via email, and that is uh, ftroika, F-T-R-O-Y-K-A, at consomer.com, and that's C-O-N-N hyphen, F-E-L-M-E-R, and if uh, for some reason uh, that's a little unclear, the Consomer Education website has all our has contact information for 120, 130 different clinicians, of which I am just one. And Eric, can I give a sort of a not so shameless plug? Sure. Consumer Institute is a phenomenal place for a young teacher, a college student to go and network with some of the biggest names in the country. Names like Richard Saucedo, Paula Kleiner, Larry Livingston, Randy Greenwell, Tim Lotzenheiser. I mean, just icons of our profession that are the movers and shakers that I mean, people get their jobs at every year because because of the opportunity it presents. And, uh, I, one of the greatest joys for me is I'm in charge of the collegiate track, and I get to tailor that experience for the college students based on what I believe they really need. And that's just immensely fulfilling for me. And they make it super cheap. It's a hundred bucks, ninety nine dollars for four days. Which it it's I went there last summer. I'm going there this upcoming summer, and it. I can vouch for it. it's truly a once in a lifetime experience. You're you're meeting all these great educators in the field. The food there is absolutely phenomenal yeah. too. It deserves to be mentioned. Having a steak yeah. steak dinner with Paula Kreider is it's like a pretty <laughs> yeah. insane experience to be like, yeah, that happened. I just sat down and had 
a great dinner. Yeah. I chatted with Paula Kreider. Yeah. And, and, that's, and, that's, that's, and that's all by design. It's all about bringing people together. And that's June 7th through the 10th, 2020. Yeah, well, Frank, thank you very much uh, for being a guest on the podcast. I, I really appreciate uh, your willingness to share everything you know about about all this, and I'm sure the listeners do too. Um, and plus, it's just great talking to you again. Well, Eric, thank you for what you're doing for future music educators. Okay, this, this, this kind of thing makes a real difference, and I just I admire what you're doing so much, so keep up the great work. All right, thank you, Frank. Bye bye. You bet. Take care. Bye bye. All right. That was an absolute phenomenal opportunity to get to interview and chat with Frank Troika. Um, once again, I'm truly thankful that he was able to call in and, and share with you guys everything he knew. And hopefully it's, it's a little bit helpful. And I, I know I have learned just a ton in, in this time I've spent chatting with him and, and the times I've interacted with him. He's truly a great figure in music education and a, and a great mentor. Going on, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we'll be posting on Facebook some examples of some good and bad resumes along with uh, those commonly asked questions that Frank has. And other than that, let's let's go ahead and wrap up. Um, you've been listening to Not Your Forte podcast. Make sure that you take time to, on whatever app or whatever you listen to your podcast on, to subscribe, rate five stars, comment, do all these kind of really small things that help us out immensely. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You can just find us Not Your Forte Podcast. We're pretty easy to find. If you ever have any questions that you want answered on the podcast or suggestions for the pod on what we should talk about, um, send us an email at notyourfortepodcast at gmail.com. And we, we look forward to just continuing to, to grow as a podcast. I'm very thankful for... for friends for family for for you listeners for dr Payne for allowing me to continue just this fun dream of mine to reach out to the music education community and try to contribute in, in, in a way in which i think i can so anyway let's let's go ahead and wrap up we'll be on our merry way and i'll see you guys in two weeks bye-bye <laughs>